Well, it's good to be here this afternoon. And I guess you just might as well praise God for all the rain and the flood waters because we're getting it. So we might as well tell God thank you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Tell you what, t- take your Bible, turn to Genesis 1, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And appreciate everybody coming out and everybody joining us online. And um, we're glad to be here today. Genesis chapter 1. Let's read verse, start in verse 14. Going through the book of Genesis, dealing with the days of creation. And uh, it's taken me longer to teach about the creation than it did for God to actually create it. But there's a lot of substance there. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. And God said, let there be lights. Notice that's very similar to what he said in verse 3. Let there be light. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for, not to count them, signs, seasons, for days and years. Now think about that. How many seasons are there? There's four. Okay. Did man invent that? No. God did that. So let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Think about that. That's what we're talking about tonight. Stars as angels. All right. And Sister Edwina back here had a had she had a fantastic question. And I said your name right tonight, didn't I? Edwina. Ed the winner. Right. She said. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to entertain strangers because it might be. So how can it be angels here and stars up there? Well, that's a good question. When I see God, I'll ask him. All right. No, I'll explain it tonight. They're bigger than we, we are. They're different than we are. They're not made of the same substance. And they're not literally in the same realm as us. They're higher than us. So that gives them abilities that we don't have. So anyway, God set them, verse 17, God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll go to, uh, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5 here in a second. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this is, a, this is a big Bible. There's a lot of things in it, Father. And we pray, dear God, that you give us as much understanding as our minds and our spirits can understand. And We pray, dear God, that you would be our teacher tonight. You would give us the lesson. You would, Father, show us great and mighty things that we don't know And I pray, dear God, that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts and help us, dear God, to understand the creation that you made and us being your new creation. Help us, dear God, to understand how you make things, how you how you made us and how you remade us to be born again. So, Father, in a world of darkness. Let this light shine in our hearts and then let us shine as lights in the world. So We pray, dear God, that you would just give us light, give us understanding, prepare us for days that are come that we don't know what evil is going to come on the earth. We just know that it's coming. And I pray, dear God, that you would fill us with enough knowledge and wisdom for it to be the stability of our times. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, just on a little side uh, rabbit chase here. Because he, I mean, he made it a point to say it, you know, several times here. Divide the light from the darkness, the day from the night. Those two are different one from another. We're living in a world right now where everybody's trying to blur all the lines between things that are opposite... There's a church, I I don't get on Facebook much, but I got on it today and somebody was saying that there's a church that gotten, they're getting in trouble from the LGBTQ, PRVT, QRS crowd 
because they put a sign up on their church sign that said a boy is not a girl and a girl is not a boy. Now, I happen to agree with that. Okay? God made them different. Okay? He did not make them the same. They're not the same. God made, and of course, we, we uh, you know, my wife and I attended this deal over here in Hillsboro a couple years ago where that boy who wanted to wear a dress to school and then go in the girls' locker room, the girls' shower, and the girls' bathroom because he claimed that he was a girl, not a boy. So he had a big rally. And all the LGBTQ lettuce, gravy, bacon, tomato people from St. Louis came down to celebrate this guy and I was there with a camera and I captured and he was getting all these questions from National Public Radio and he, they were giving him all these softball questions and so as I'm recording him I asked him I said so would it be right for a male teacher to go in the girls bathroom and he said no I said would it be right for any of the other male students to go in the girls bathroom and he said it wouldn't be right for any boy to go in the bathroom, girl's bathroom, and he said, I am not a boy. Now his plumbing says different. And his DNA says different. His DNA is different. He has the addition of a Y chromosome. That's what makes him male. Simply because he wants to put a dress on, he thinks that makes him female. And I watched a documentary the other day where in Connecticut, I believe it was one of these New England liberal states, they went ahead and said in all the public schools that transgendered students can compete in sports events of the gender of their choice. So you had this girl who was really good in track and field. And before they said this, I mean, she had all these awards and medals and trophies and everything like that for running and doing track and field. When they instituted that new policy, all the girls were being beaten in every event by male students who claimed that they were female. And the girl, and this is, you know, Connecticut, New England, and these girls were going, that's not fair. Their, mus their muscle system is different and their skeletal system is different and it gives them an advantage. This is why girls do not compete against men in almost any sport. Bowling, professional bowling has a women's league and a men's league because they cannot compete against men. Most women cannot compete against men. So we're living in a day, I didn't plan on talking about this, but we are living in a day where the lines are being blurred every day. And yet from the creation, God said, this is day and this is night. And there is no in between. Okay, so turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. You're already there. I need to get, I need to get with it. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at here. There are, no line, there are no blurry lines in your Bible. Verse 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now notice he uses two words here, day and night. Day is not night. Night is not day. The sun rules over the day, moon and stars rule over the night. God gave them an ordination. He ordained them in their courses to do what it is they do. So he says, verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4, now here's where it is right here. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Look at what he says here in verse 5. You are all children of light. Now, if the, if the light is no longer light, but it's darkness, then who's our father? Or what is our father? If we're children of the light, but now the lines are blurred, and what's light is darkness, and what's darkness is light, then what are we? Okay? So, you're all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. It's not who we, we, there is a separation between God's people and the world and always should be a clear line of separation. 
And I just, I want to encourage everybody. I don't mean to beat everybody over the head, but I want to encourage you tonight. In your life, start asking God to put the difference between you and the world. I know there's, I know there's issues, always going to be issues in everybody's life. I mean, we're sinners saved by grace. We have a wicked, hell-deserving, sinful nature that wants to, always wants to cheat against God, always wants to get away with things. So it, you cannot fight it in the flesh. You cannot just simply say, I'm going to do right all the time and that's how it's going to be. Your flesh is not going to go along with it. So that's why you ask God, God help me. God help me to separate my life away from this world, not toward this world. The world is going to be destroyed and everybody in it. God says, get on the ark. The ark then separates those who have the wrath of God upon them and those whom God has salvation on. So you're children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. By the way, if you're sober, you're not drunk. And if you're drunk, you don't get arrested for driving while sober. At least, I hope not. Let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For that. And by the way, why be sober? Because the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if you're not sober, you'll not know when the lion's coming. So let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So back here in Genesis, uh, four, Genesis chapter one. Now remember, there's a, there's a, I mean, the literal interpretation of scripture that yes, God did every bit of this and he did it in exactly six 24 hour days. And how do we know that? Because the Bible says in the evening and the morning were the first day, evening and the morning were the second day. I mean, it says there's no wiggle room here. There's no, well, that was, you know, that was four billion years. And then this next day, that probably was three and a half billion years. And, you know, that's how God did it. But that doesn't add up because if these are separate eras of time that last billions of years, how could there have been the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day when light was already created on the first day. It contradicts scripture. So I just believe that in six literal days, God did this. God could have done it in two seconds. He could have done it in less than two seconds. But he chose six days to give us the work week. Work six days, rest the seventh. That's what God did. So now we talked about you know, the, the greater light versus the lesser light, the greater light, the sun, the lesser light, the moon. You can look at it like uh, where we saw there in First Thessalonians 5, the children of the day, sun, the sun is the greater light. Jesus, his face shone like the sun in Matthew 17. Um, you know, he's the Malachi chapter four. He's the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So we are children of God in the daytime with the light shining on us. And then, of course, Satan would be, he's the prince of darkness. Uh, in Ephesians 6, they are the rulers of the darkness of this world. So we have that difference there. We have that idea there. And then we have this idea of the creation week being a picture of how God saves someone. David said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. In other words, do, do what you do when you create things. God, only God can create. And so God has a process by which he creates a new man in us. It starts out with us being void and dark like day one. But then God shows us the separation in day two. God says, here's the heaven up here. Here's the earth down here. God says, as high, higher, as higher, well, I can't say it right. I just read it before church. I just read that chapter in Isaiah. God said, as, you know, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. So God separates himself from us. We're, we realize we're not God. We realize that we're not in charge. God is. Day three, God sows the seed. That's what he did on day three. He created the, the plants and things that bear seed. Just like a tree planted by rivers of living water. That's what God did on day three. So the seed of the word of God coming into our hearts, being sown in our hearts. Now day four. God has already declared to us, let there be light. 
And so now we're seeing things differently. But now then God gives us the source of that light. Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. That's the New Testament. The Old Testament. Where the, uh, Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So now we understand that God's not just in any religion. God is in one. And if I didn't believe that, I'd be the worst minister in the world. And believe it or not, there's a lot of ministers that don't believe that anymore. They don't believe, they believe, oh, oh, you're, you're a Muslim, oh, you, you're, you're the same, you know, you're the same as us, we all serve the same God. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe we all serve the same God. I believe that there's one God. His name is the Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God had a son. And if you're Muslim, you don't believe that. So anyway, that's, I mean, that's just how it is. God's now giving us the source of the light. And the light is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He came to bring that light that lighteth every man and that comes into the world. So that's kind of what we dealt with before tonight. So now I wanted to show you, I believe, and there's some difference in opinion on this. Some, because people have asked me, Pastor, when do you think the angels were created? Some say that they were created before the creation. I don't believe that. I think, some say they were created on day one. They were there with God. But I believe that they were created on day four. Because you have the stars. And every place in the Bible where it mentions stars. It's giving you a, the relationship that the stars have to angels. Okay? So hence, uh, the sister asked me, how can they be stars up here and be down here? Well, they're just better at it than we are. All right? So I'll, I'll kind of move along. But here's, here's, my, here's my reasoning behind this. Job 38, 7. And I covered some of this, so I'm not going to speak on it much. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So stars and uh, sons of God shouted for joy. By the way, I just I remember the name. We had, we had such a great time last night. We picked Michael up from the airport coming back from Kenya. And we took him to Red Lobster up by the airport. And God gave us the most wonderful waitress in the whole world. And her name was Venus. And I, I, didn't, I didn't catch that until just now. I'm going, that was her name, Venus. She said, Venus, just like the planet. Beautiful, beautiful black lady. And she was, you could tell, she was working for tips. Because she did a tremendous job. And I tipped her well. But before I tipped her, she come over there. And I grabbed her by the hand. And I said, can we pray with you? I just feel led to pray with you and for you. She said, oh, yes. She went into this, man. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Amen. Praise Jesus. And I'm just going, I like her, you know. I mean, we had church right there, Red Lobster, you know. And uh, bless her heart. But, you know, i tell you what I prayed. I said, God, pray. I, God, I pray that you bless her, bless her family. God, if she has any sins, forgive her of her sins. And God, draw her close to your word and your gospel. And Jesus, she's just going, yes, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. It was just good. It's good to see people like that. Amen. So you pray for Venus. All right. Anyway, Psalm 148.3, praise him, ye sun and moon, praise him, all ye stars of light. So God is giving an attribute to the stars that they have the ability to praise God. Back in Job 38.7, they have the ability to sing. Stars sing. And I mentioned that last week. It is a known fact that stars have a, there's a vibration to them. They emit waves that under certain conditions can be heard. They literally do exactly what God said they did. And again, Job was the earliest of all the Bible writers. Job was the earliest one. It was not known in Job's day that stars emitted waves of sound. It was not, we just now know it, relatively speaking. But anyway, Isaiah 14, 13, notice here is, I, Lucifer saying, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Why does he just want to rule over the stars? What are they to him? He knows they're angels. Judges 5.20, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. 
So he's telling you that these stars are the host of heaven. Because that's what he says, that, that they are the host, the heavenly host. Uh, so now Revelation 9. Notice that. In fact, turn your Bible to Revelation 9. Turn your Bible to Revelation anyway. We're going to be there in a few seconds. All right. Let me hear them pages. There you go. Make, make a joyful noise on the Lord. Revelation 9. Here we have a star falling. Now, you know, the Bible gets criticized in this because they say, well, star, we know that's not true because stars don't actually fall. Those are meteorites. Okay? The word star in the Bible applies to any stellar object, be it meteorite, planet, whatever. But it's personifying this particular star giving it the attributes of something that has the ability to take a key and unlock a lock. Because that's what happens. Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him, a part, not to it, but to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this star, number one is masculine, number two was given to this star this angel the key jesus has the key gave it to this angel this angel then opened up with that key the bottomless pit so it is telling us that a star is an angel and angels are they are ministers of light that's what they're made of they're made of light they're made of fire the Bible says, in fact, somebody look this verse up for me if you can, and we'll go to it. Where It's in the book of Psalms. I don't know why I don't have it in my notes here, but it's in the book of Psalms where it says uh, he has made his ministers, his angels, ministers. How is it? Something about his angels and his ministers. Look up the phrase flaming fire. Flaming fire. Where is that? Psalm 104.4. Turn there. Now, and, you know, think about it. What is it that we know about the stars? They're all fire. Our own sun is fire. So Psalm 104, again, Psalms written 3,000, 1,000 years before Christ, three, two, you know, 3,000 years from today. So how is it that these tent-dwelling Jews knew Anything about the mechanics of the universe. They didn't. God told them. What Psalm 104, 4. Who maketh his angels spirits. His ministers of flaming fire. Now, let me just kind of give you a little side note on this. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible tells us the difference between those of the heavenly realm and those of the earthly realm. There is a difference. But Psalm 15, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the celestial beings have bodies. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, there are terrestrial bodies and bodies celestial, meaning of the heavens. So they have a form, and it, our, our version of a spirit is Casper the Friendly Ghost. That it has no form, it has no substance. It has no shape to it, but every place you read in the Bible concerning angels, they have a form. In Genesis 18, you have three men walking to Abraham, but they're not just ordinary men. One of them is the Lord before he is incarnated in Bethlehem, and two of them are angels. And we know that because at the end of Genesis 18, they talk amongst themselves and they say, should we hide from Abraham the thing we've been sent to do? And what they were sent to do is, you go to Genesis 19, and it says two angels came to meet Lot at Sodom. So these two men were the angels who went to Sodom to tell Lot, God's going to destroy this town, get your family out of here. And it's the two men that the men of Sodom wanted to sodomize. That's what they did. They said, bring us out, bring them out to us so we may know them. Sickening. Amen? 
sickening stuff. So anyway, um, where is it going with that? That's pretty good. Oh, but anyway, back in Genesis 18, you see that these, these men, along with the Lord, Abraham bid them sit down. Servants came and washed their feet. They were served up a meal of... They, uh, Abraham had killed a calf and dressed it, which means he put dressing with it, stuffing. <laughs> Amen. Calf stuffed with stuffing. So they ate the calf. They ate the bread that Abraham gave them. These angels ate, right? So there was substance to their bodies, and yet that wasn't all there was to these angels. There was more to them than that. Because they are of a higher dimension than us, a higher realm. So what we see of them individually as dots of light in the sky, and yet there's more to it. I, I explained it to Sister Edwina this way. If you look here on the floor, you see me, but then you see my shadow. If you look only at my shadow, you're not going to get all of what I am. There's a form of it, but it's not all of who I am. There's a dimension that if you're looking or you can only see my shadow, you can't see all of what I am. Does everybody follow that so far? So take that up one level. These angels, we can see a part of them. Every night, but we cannot see all of what they are. There is a form of them that is unseen to us living in this world. Okay? So, we see them as dots of light in the sky. And for five, six thousand years, we thought there was only about a thousand, twelve, fifteen hundred stars in the sky. Somewhere around the 1400s, that's what some guy counted. He counted up about 1500 stars and said, that's the number of stars. They didn't have telescopes. So then they invented telescopes and they started looking and they're going, wait a minute, there's stars out there that we couldn't see. So then we sent Hubble up. And Hubble saw things that we had never seen. We didn't know, had no idea. So now we know that the second heaven that God created is unfathomably huge and it is full of stars everywhere innumerable all right so revelation 12 turn there this really this really sort of you know out of the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established so that's what I'm attempting to do tonight is give you witnesses from the scriptures that tell us that science knows a piece of it, but they don't know all of it because they don't believe the Bible. If they believe the Bible, then they would go, oh, that's the rest of the story. So Revelation 12, we have two great wonders in the heaven. One is the woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars upon her head. Then we have in verse 3, another wonder appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. That's Satan, because it tells us that in verse 9. That great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know who that dragon is. And by the way, that's his form. That's the body that he inhabits. That's who he is. He is a beast. He's a dragon. He's a serpent. All right? So we know that some of the... Because we know their Bible talks about dragons, plural. So then we... You know, we kind of understand that there is a multitude of the angelic realm that are made like dragons, serpents, okay? Beasts is what they are. But then we have other creatures in the angelic realm. We have uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 where we have the cherubs, where they have four wings. They have four faces, one like a man, like an ox, like an eagle, and like a lion. We have those. We have the seraphs in Isaiah chapter 6. We have different places in the Bible where the Bible mentions different types of spirits. So the idea that a devil is a guy in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork, you're not going to find that one in the scriptures. 
You are going to find, you know, fiery flying serpents. You're going to find satyrs. You're going to find, you know, things like dragons. Or you're going to find things like satyrs. Well, I already mentioned satyrs. Owls, different types of spirit, things like that. So we know that these angels have multiple different types of bodies, like different creatures here on the earth. There's different creatures up in the heavenly realm. So in Revelation 12, this dragon in verse 4 is tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now again, we know that our star, the sun, is very much bigger than our little tiny planet earth. We even know that the planet Jupiter is massively bigger than the planet Earth. And we also know that there are certain stars out there amongst the heavens where our sun would not even be a drop in a bucket compared to the size of some of these stars. Like Betelgeuse is one of them, and it's huge. So if we were looking simply at these humongous balls of fiery light Falling down the earth, the earth doesn't stand a chance. It's going to be consumed by just one of them. But since now we're adding in this idea that these stars are angels. Now then, God allows them to fall and become part of our world. They literally fall to the earth. Whereas before, they were not subject to... To gravity because the Bible describes some of them as fiery flying serpents those are the ones that bit the Jews in the wilderness where Moses had to put a serpent on a on a pole so God allows them to be subject to the gravity of the earth they fall like we would fall all right so his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven did cast them to the earth the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for it to devour her child as soon as it was born. So now if you look in verse 7, the same chapter. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Literally, hell's angels. Right? So and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So verse 9, the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we have two verses in the same chapter. One telling you they are stars. One telling you that they are angels. And it's not that the Bible is contradicting itself. The Bible is teaching you when you see one, that's what they, when you see an angel, it's a star. When you see a star, it's an angel. And not all of the angels are good, but not all of the angels are bad. One third of them taken, cast down to the earth. They're going to take on a form of whatever body God has designed for them. And they're going to fall to, they're going to lose their light. They're going to become dark, the Bible says. And they're literally going to be taken in by the gravity of the earth and they're going to fall to the earth. And... Might I say that once they fall, they're not just going to lay around and wait for an ambulance to come pick them up. They are going to start a war. They're going to start a battle between God, Jesus Christ, and ten thousands of his saints coming down from heaven, fighting the beast, the false prophet, and all of the army that he gathers together fighting that last battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Daniel 8.10 gives us a third witness to this. He's talking about the beast, the little horn, and he says, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So now we have a, a third witness here. Daniel pretty much consolidating in one verse what is expanded upon in Revelation 12, where this great horn is going to wax so great even to the host. Remember what Lucifer wanted to do in, Revelation, in Isaiah 14. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. 
So in Daniel 8.10, that's what you see, this little horn waxing great, even to the host of heaven, casting down the host, the stars. Same thing in my mind. Some of the host and of the stars, it's the Bible's way of explaining the host are the stars and the stars are the host to the ground, stamping upon them. All right? So now they're subject to the laws of physics in this world. Now they can't do what they used to could do. That's redneck talk, used to could. Amen? We all understand used to could, don't we? So they used to could fly around and go through walls, but now they can't. They've been subject to the vanity that humans are subject to. All right? So look at now. Let's take this idea. These evil stars up in the heavens, God's going to curse them and cast them to the earth. Now watch this. Simultaneously, God takes his people, those whom he has blessed, and he blesses them to leave earth to go live up there to be as the stars of heaven. Okay? Taking the bad angels, kicking them out, making them come down here, Taking his saints, raising them up to be in the heavens, to live in their house, amen. To dwell in, it's like squatting on a rich man's house. Which people do that, don't they? Some guy has his house up for foreclosure or whatever, people move in and squat there. And they think they can take over that house and own it. Well... We're going to get to live in their house. Like Israel. When Israel went into the promised land, God told them, I'm going to give you their houses and their cities. You're going to get to live there with them. So look at Genesis 22. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee, thy seed as the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Genesis 37, 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his bread. This is Joseph. And said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And you remember, when Jacob heard this dream, he got mad. He said, What are you saying? That me, your mother, and your eleven brothers are going to bow to you? So he ascribed the brothers of Joseph, the eleven tribes. He called them the stars of the heaven. Deuteronomy 1.10, the Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. And you're going to see something here in a minute. God means exactly what he says. Deuteronomy 4.19, unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven. See, here he says it here in this one verse. Stars, host of heaven. What was, what happened on the day Christ was born? The shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch of their flocks at night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, the glory of the land. And they were so afraid. Okay. And it was the, the heavenly host. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. That was the angels. The stars. Should us be driven to worship them. Acts chapter 7 verse 43. Notice this. You took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God Remphan. Rimphan is a devil, a little G, God, and yet he calls him a star. Jude one thirteen, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now I know it's a little after five, but I got to get to this because I've told you two Sundays in a row I was going to teach you this. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights. In the world. And what we know from what Jesus said is that when we die in the resurrection, we will be as the angels of heaven. So we're going to go and take their place and shine as lights in the world. Now, turn to Revelation 1. Here it is right here. Drum roll, please. I've been waiting. People have been waiting on this one. Because I showed you this picture. Take a look at this. Okay? In fact, let me get my pen out. And I'll... I'll draw on this for you, all right? So here, come on, get back there. Here's the earth, right here. Are you with me? You with me, Todd? What are you doing? Huh? 
Drum roll, okay. One in every crowd. So here's the earth. The earth is the basement. The earth is the exact center of everything that God is doing in this creation. I don't believe God has other planets that Jesus visits and dies for all their sin. I don't believe. The Bible doesn't tell us that. I don't believe it for a second. I believe the earth is unique as the habitation of man. God did not send Jesus Christ to Mars, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, or that other planet that I'm not going to say what it is. He did not send Jesus to any of those. He sent Jesus here to earth. And below earth is hell. All right? And no, I don't believe the earth's flat. Okay? But I want you to look at this. From the perspective of earth, the sun is surrounded by seven planets. You have the sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They kicked Pluto out. For a while they said it was a planet. Then they looked when the two voyagers traveled out there. They recently said Pluto is not a planet. It's, not, it's there, but it's not big enough. It doesn't have the attributes of a real planet. So it's not one of the, of the main planets of our solar system. So, from the Earth perspective, there are seven planets. And the sun, they all orbit the sun. The sun's in the middle. And these seven planets surround the sun, right? Now look in your Bible. Look in Revelation 1. Remember Revelation chapter 1. John said, I'm in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I'm praying. And he said, all of a sudden I heard a voice behind me as the sound of a trumpet. I turned and looked. And I saw one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a girdle, his hair white like wool, white as snow. Okay? And he said, his voice sounded like a trumpet. So in verse 12 he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as, it, as if they had burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth, went a sharp two-edged sword and look at this his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength so here is you look back in verse 13 in the midst of the seven candlesticks was the sun and here in the midst of the seven planets is the sun from our perspective. Now understand this. In John's day. John writes this somewhere around A.D. 95. Not anywhere past 100 A.D. From their perspective. They had no idea. That the planets orbited the sun. They had no concept of that. Some of them probably still thought the earth was flat. We now know different. Most people know different. Okay. But they had no idea that the universe and the solar system was laid out exactly this way. So here's Jesus showing up and he's seven candlesticks and he's in the midst of them. And there beside earth, there are seven other planets that surround the sun. Now, I'm going to give you a better thing of this and I'm going to let you go. Jesus promised, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And what he said was... What did he say? He said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Not on the outside, 
in the midst of them. So all of us here gathered together. We gathered here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're not talking about politics and we're not talking about football and we're not talking about hockey. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about the Bible. And here is the word of God right here in our midst tonight. So it doesn't matter if it's in this church or in every church in the world or even in the universe. Jesus Christ is always in the midst of his people. Somebody say amen. Father in heaven, I love this book. I love what it says. I love how it says that there is so much wisdom here. Knowledge that surpasses understanding, and yet knowledge that is discernible, discoverable. We have so many things yet unknown about the creation that you created for us. And yet everything that I find out tells me that this Bible is always right. And it was your word that created this universe to begin with. Father, every cell in my body is this same picture. Every atom of every molecule looks exactly like this exact same thing. You being in the midst of those things that surround you. And Father, I pray to your God that you open our eyes up further. Show us great and mighty things from your word. Teach us wonderful things. Help us to behold wondrous things from your law. Prepare us for Days to come, prepare us for this week. Bless our church, bless its people. And Father, just walk with us, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed with blessing.